Hi everybody and welcome. This is World of Info and we're starting right away with Dr. Amr Mabrouk, Professor of Plastic Surgery at Ain Shams University, Dua Muhammad at the controls, I'm Najla Nagib and we're with you until 5 o'clock so stay with us. Yes, back again. This is World of Info and today we have uh, our distinguished guest, His Excellency Mr. Uh, Sean O'Regan, Ambassador of Ireland in Egypt. Well, it's a great pleasure and honor. Uh, really, we appreciate His, uh, His Excellency valuable time to, to come to us in such a uh, short notice and a very busy schedule and a tight schedule because Mr. Sean O'Regan is not only the ambassador of Ireland in, in Cairo, but he's also the ambassador uh, in Amman and in, in, in Beirut. And uh, he was uh, w serving uh, before in China, Turkey, Finland, and he was the ambassador in Slovenia of his country in Slovenia and Bosnia. With a very uh, uh, colorful career and a great experience, it's always uh, wonderful to have such an experienced diplomat coming uh, to visit us in Radio Cairo. And speaking about his beloved country, I, I always uh, we were discussing with him off air, Ireland has a very big place and at the same period of time. Our independence was uh, a bit... Uh, uh, subtracted from a lot of activities but your independence was also in the 20s of the last century and it was a, a great uh, struggle to, to become a state or a republic in the end and definitely it's a beautiful country only 4.8 million inhabitants yes it has influenced the world was it through its culture or through its influential immigrants sir it's a great pleasure and thank you very much I know we have a lot of questions we're going to keep you busy but we are really uh, uh, hoping that you will be patient with us. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, um, and uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that you can really separate the, uh, the 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 culture and the immigration. Um, our history of immigration is long and, for the most part, sad. Mm -hmm. um, we estimate there are some 70 million Irish people or people of Irish heritage mm. around the world, um, and uh, I think I think you have to remember that uh, even when they emigrated, the Irish people were cohesive communities uh, in their new homes, and they worked together to elect uh, representatives in politics, in in labour unions, um, and uh, national level, local level, um, and that's was often done, especially in, in, in countries where they emigrated to, in the face of some real discrimination. Mm. Um, and, and that was also one of the reasons they, they stuck together. Mm. Um, and that's one of the reasons as well why we have such an influence, because mm. that's, there's a long tradition of Irish involvement in, in politics in the US, in politics in Britain, and in politics in Australia, which are, are some of the main centres of Irish Irish emigration. But the, immigra the immigration was, I mean, there were waves of immigration that even continued until the 60s of the 20th century. We have heard the, of the greatest immigration wave happened in the mid 19th century after the Great Famine that happened, yeah. unfortunately, with people uh, going abroad uh, to Canada and the United States with great influence, of course, on the north and eastern uh, coast of the United States of America. And names after that that became so familiar in the American politics, of course, we not to mention, of course, one of the most famous is uh, Kennedy, the Kennedys, of course, who are still lingering around and still very proud of their uh, Irish heritage, by the way. I mean, they, sure. they are prou proud of their Catholicism, they are proud of their Irish he heritage and makes them very unique. And uh, when I reach even in history, I found that Duke Wellington himself was a great war hero and uh, an important uh, figure and a prime minister uh, and uh, one of the people who served uh, his, uh, his motherland trying to get them some rights is uh, Irish of Irish descendancy, right? Yeah, the Duke of Wellington was, was born in Ireland, mm. um, but you have to remember he was a, a British general mm. and uh, he fought very, very hard for, yes. for Britain. He fought yeah. Napoleon, he's, yeah, and th yes. that's where his reputation comes from. Yes. Um, but we don't think of him so much as being a, an um, Irish, Irish nationalist. nationalist. <laughs> you know. yes. um, uh, Although the, he tried the, sometimes in, in being in the, in the, in the, during his prime minister well, to convince the king, right, to, uh, to give some rights to the Irish, right? Well, I, th I, th I, th I think uh, the, the, the record might show that he was very, very grateful for the many, many Irish men uh, who served with him in the Napoleonic Wars. Mm. Uh, and in fact, I was reading recently that um, were it not for an Irish soldier who closed the gates on a farm and prevented French soldiers from taking the farm, 
that uh, the Battle of Waterloo might well have been lost. Oh. So if, <laughs> if, 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 if Wellington did anything, it may have been in gratitude for that kind of yes. thing. Mm. Um, but in that period, the greatest nationalist um, that uh, Ireland has had was, was probably Daniel O'Connell. Of course. Um, and um, he was the man who we called uh, the Great Liberator, um, largely because of his campaign for Catholic emancipation, mm. the, 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 the work that he did to ensure that Catholics could vote, mm. that Catholics could go to university, even that Catholics could be buried in a designated graveyard, mm. because up until then it, it, it wasn't possible. I, yeah. I really don't understand why this racial discrimination in, in religion-wise, and I remember that even, uh, I told you that my mother and father lived for some time in, in Dublin, and my mother was always saying that her neighbors who were very beautiful, uh, uh, kind persons and people were always uh, bitter about the fact that they had felt this discrimination against the, the Catholicism in, in, in Ireland. Do you have an explanation for that? I mean, oh. why, why does it come from political perspective, from the, especially from the, 18, the year of 1800 or whatever? No, I, th I think, I think um, the, the sort of the, the antagonism between mm. Catholics and Protestants goes back to the, the Reformation. Of course. Uh, and uh, it's something that's continued. You could say that Ireland was, it's, uh, has, has, has suffered uh, that that's, uh, more than most other countries. Um, but in fact, if you look at other countries in Europe, um, they too have had the special arrangements to, mm. to reduce uh, that antagonism. I think about the Netherlands, for example, mm. where they had for a long time a, a pillared society and there was a, a Catholic Social Democratic Party and a Protestant Social Democratic Party mm. and Catholic Christian Democrats and Protestant Social uh, Christian Democrats. And similarly in, 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 in Germany, there are mm. the, the special arrangements made to, to, to deal with this, this antagonism. Mm. Um, in Ireland, perhaps it was more pronounced because the sovereign was Protestant mm -hmm. and the people were Catholic. Yes. Um, and and I think that's maybe where where the big the biggest discrimination comes right, from. Yes, you, yes. Know? Mm -hmm. you know. So it's a it's a great it's a great long struggle for independence ever since the Test Act of 1672, where discrimination was legalized, as you have just mentioned. And as I told you, sir, the the Great Britain in 19, 1800 was the first was it the first trigger for the independence? Do you think so? Again, this this you know. Every country has a very complex mm. and nuanced history. Um, I don't know that you can assign a particular event or date uh, to say this is where the independence struggle started. Um, the, the, the Act of Union uh, which brought together the British and Irish parliaments um, certainly led to an economic decline mm. in Ireland uh, over many, many years. And it escaped um, the Industrial Revolution, unfortunately. Well, yes. Uh, and, and we wanted uh, to, to make the field of, uh, of culture, uh, cultivating field, I mean, right, agricultural well, field. Well, yeah. well, again, I'm not a professional historian, um, but I think, I think it's fair to say that there was a lack of investment in Ireland, and Ireland was seen very, very much as a place to grow food, as you say, mm. um, and um, uh, Ireland certainly suffered, and that, that was certainly an impulse towards the the land reform of the 1850s and the the campaign to have mm. the the sovereignty or the the parliament returned to Dublin, which ran through to the end of the the 1900s. Um, but I would say, you know, the 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 if you were to look at certain dates. Uh, I think perhaps the the Battle of Kinsale in 1601, which ended the old Gaelic order in Ireland, mm -hmm. um, or just a couple of years before the Act of Union, the Rebellion of 1798, mm -hmm. uh, were probably more significant in terms of gathering a, a, mm -hmm. a an Irish identity mm -hmm. and a sense of a particular sense of grievance that we could only achieve what we should be able to achieve through independence, mm -hmm. um, and especially. The, the, the 1798 rebellion, the, the reprisals um, by the Crown forces were particularly difficult for people to bear uh, and they, they led to a, a, sense, a real sense of grievance in Ireland, um, which was repeated, unfortunately, several years later um, in 1916. Yes. Yeah. Now we find ourselves in 1840s, we're talking oh. about the 19th century, which was 
a very terrible period in the history of Ireland. That is the Great Famine. I mean, there was a devastating winter and uh, which stayed for a long time, almost one year uh, of a winter with very bad crops and people just starved to death. Mm. And this was the only solution for these uh, people. I mean, they, they, they say even could have been uh, 250,000 people have died or something like that. Mm. Uh, so there were a lot of people who tried to emigrate to mm. the States. So I think this is one of the greatest waves. Of the Looking backwards, was the chances of life success for these immigrants if they have stayed? Well, look, I mean, we, we, we had a population of nearly 8 million yes, uh, before in, the famine, in, yes. in, in 1841. Mm -hmm. There was a census in 1841 mm -hmm. which had counted 8 million people. And you never reached the, that again? The, well, the 1851 census showed the population was less than 4 million. Mm -hmm. um, and modern study suggests that maybe a million people died in the famine mm -hmm. and 3 million left the country. To be honest, I think if they had stayed, they would probably have died. Um, and uh, the real tragedy of that, though, is that Ireland was actually exporting food at the time. Mm. Uh, and uh, it wasn't a lack of food that caused the famine. It was policy choices that were made by the government. Um, and the ordinary people uh, relied on the potato as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as their main food. Uh, and the potato crop failed in mm. three successive years because of infection and, as you say, because of bad weather. Um, and so the, all these people had to leave. Um, but we were, in fact, exporting grain at the time. And that's, that's, that's uh, but I, you know, as we know, I think Amartya Sen has very, very clearly said famines are caused, they're not accidents. And they're caused by policy choices. Yes. Uh, and, and, um, and it, it was a terrible tragedy for us. It affected the economy for more than a hundred years, and it started a chain of emigration which continued uh, right up until, as you said, the 1960s. Mm. Uh, and by the by the end of the 1950s, the the population of Ireland had fallen to uh, a little over two and a half million. Mm. Um, on the positive side, the Irish diaspora mm. has been very very important uh, both in rebuilding the economy. And as we said at the very beginning, in, in uh, making sure that the Irish voice is heard around the world. world. So I think after the break we have to talk about the Irish diaspora because sure. this is a very interesting mm. uh, group of, of people, strong uh, uh, community that is living abroad in the United States, in, in Canada, in, in Australia and even in the UK. Mm. Gives us an idea about that, but I think after the break. So back again, word of info, and you can call us at 257894. 9407 with His Excellency Ambassador Sean O'Regan, Ambassador of Ireland in Egypt. So, back again, word of info with His Excellency Ambassador Sean O'Regan, Ambassador of Ireland in Egypt, Dr. Amr Abrook, Professor of Plastic Surgery at Enchantment University. So, uh, really, really, this is kind of a big surprise for me. We are talking about uh, Irish diaspora and we're talking about important politicians. Uh, for example, in the United States, we'll start with the United States, and we all know, everybody must know, of course, that uh, Kennedy, the charming Kennedy, and the whole Camelot of Kennedy, and all this big, huge family that has occupied the history of the world, the modern world, since 1960s, or even during their father's time, Joseph Kennedy, as an ambassador in, in during World War II to, to Britain, is an Irish descendancy, and of course, he's, uh, he's a Catholic, so being the only Catholic president of the United States of America. But, for our surprise, His Excellency was telling me that he was not the only American president, president with Irish descendancy. Tell us about that, sir. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've uh, as I was saying earlier, um, the Irish have always been uh, very active in politics. And um, if, you, if you think about it, um, the, in this century alone, we've had, um, in addition to Kennedy, uh, President Nixon, President Reagan, um, and even President Obama have mm. got uh, Irish Irish ancestry. Mm. Um, now some of that ancestry goes back some way. Um, and Reagan is having a, a similar name to <laughs> like your name. <laughs> yes, and, and uh, Reagan. Uh, sorry, yeah, right? yeah. Uh, I'm a, I'm a Reagan, and uh, he was Reagan, and um, uh, that's the name comes from the south of Ireland. But there are two branches of the family. And, <laughs> and he, he comes from the northern branch. I'm from the southern branch. Uh -huh. um, but um, yeah, the, 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 the other thing that's quite remarkable uh, about the U.S. is that um, of the original signatures on the Declaration of Independence, 
um, three were born in Ireland, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I think altogether seven could claim Irish ancestry. Mm. Um, but in the mean, intervening period, uh, we've had uh, the, the uh, lots and lots of, of Irish uh, American people who have been prominent in politics. Senators uh, and congressmen. Senators and congressmen, um, mayors of big cities, the mayor of Chicago, mm. um, uh, and uh, but Ireland has strongholds in, in the United Especially States, and Massachusetts York, I, yes, is, is, is... New York and Massachusetts, I, mean, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think in New York they have a very, the Green Celebration, which is very common every year, sure. everybody is marching in it with everybody, descendancy with the green and orange colors, yeah, so yeah, this makes yeah. it very special, right? Yeah. So the same thing happened in Canada and Australia? It did. Um, in Canada, one of the, the more important uh, politicians in the foundation of Canada was a man by the name of Darcy McGee. Mm. Uh, and uh, he actually fled Ireland um, and uh, he was wanted by the Crown um, because he was accused of murder but he became a a prominent politician in Canada Mm -hmm. uh, and was very very important in 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 establishing modern Canada Mm. also in Australia um, although in truth we, we we have less politicians in Australia uh, certainly in, in in history, um, but also in New Zealand. One of the remarkable things uh, that is often forgotten is that, uh, quite aside from the North American diaspora, we've got quite a strong uh, South American diaspora. Mm. Um, many many soldiers uh, left Ireland and went to fight for Catholic monarchs mm-hmm. um, across Europe, and some of them found their way to to uh, South America. Uh, Bernardo O'Higgins, for example, um, uh, was very important, and even Che Guevara can claim an Irish ancestry. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Although he didn't speak very fluent English, but yes, he is an Irish descendant. Yes, right? exactly, That's, exactly. So the revolutionary uh, arm of Australia of of, of Irish descendancy. Uh, That's very interesting. It is. It is. So, yeah. and also there is uh, strange enough that you have mentioned also was the diaspora in Britain, right? Yes. Yes. So there are a lot of, of uh, politicians or of Irish uh, or whatever. Yeah, I mean the, the the Irish who went to Britain uh, for the in the certainly in the modern era, uh, the vast majority of them would be in the Labour Party, mm. and uh, because most of the Irish who went to Britain were working class, uh, mm. and they worked in the mines, they worked building the roads, um, uh, and and the canals, uh, and and they. Uh, being working class men, they they voted for the Labour Party mm-hmm. to a large extent, uh, and uh, the Labour Party has got many many uh, members in the party who uh, have got Irish surnames um, and varying degrees of 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 sympathy towards Ireland. Mm. Yes, so yeah. th- that's that's really very interesting because. Yeah. When we're talking about, uh, we have talked, of course, about the great struggle and the period of struggle that happened for the independence and how there was almost like a civil war and uh, people suffered in the same period that Egypt was suffering and against the same, we use the word in uh, quote unquote enemy at the time because the Britain and was an invading power of Egypt and also was an invading power of of Ireland and uh, there was the, in the end, was the independence in 1923. But Ireland did, I think, a very remarkable move which is that they were not involved in World War II. Mm-hmm. How was that possible? Because this, I think, was very difficult with everything around Europe. I mean, it's the war that has engulfed almost all the nations except for uh, two or three countries, uh, if we mention Spain and Switzerland and uh, Portugal, of course, and Ireland. But mm-hmm. Ireland especially well, is a very special case. Mm-hmm. Its borders are the, the uh, what they call North Ireland and, of course, this have been 100% part of the, of the UK and Great Britain in the war. Sure. How was that sure. possible to avoid the war? Um, well, and to act neutral and of course, yeah, with yeah. a lot of course of uh, people we have to mention that were a lot of volunteers, yeah. uh, volunteered on the Allied side. Yeah. Well, as, 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 as John F. Kennedy, who we mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, said when he visited Ireland in 1963, Ireland has an independent foreign policy, but it's never been neutral between liberty and tyranny. Mm-hmm. Um, and in our constitution, we say that um, Ireland affirms th- its devotion to the ideal of peace and friendly cooperation amongst nations founded on international justice and morality. And we take that very seriously. Mm. Um, and we take it seriously now as we did then. Mm. 
We came under huge pressure from the UK uh, to join the war, and we were asked to open strategic ports, which Britain had retained after our independence until 1938. And after the war started, they wanted them back. And we said no. Um, uh, at the same time, we returned Allied sailors and airmen who found themselves stranded in Ireland, either because a plane crashed or a ship was sunk. Um, we returned them to Britain through, through Northern Ireland, whereas we interned the Germans, mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't return them. Um, we now know that Germany had drawn up invasion plans, mm -hmm. um, but I think they were too occupied on other fronts. Yes. Um, and as you mentioned, many, many Irishmen joined the the uh, armies, air forces and navies of the Allied countries, mm. uh, particularly the United Kingdom, but also Canada, also the United States. Mm. Um, and we can't forget either that uh, Dublin was bombed by the Luftwaffe. Mm. Um, and um, I think perhaps we were just lucky that mm. we didn't get pulled into the war. Um, and perhaps for Britain, strategically, it was useful to have this Neutral, Semi -neutral. This, this, this neutral, at least nominally neutral country mm -hmm. uh, behind it. Uh, and and uh, uh, certainly, you know, we, we, we continue to export food to Britain right through the war. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, so. and it's very nice that what you have just mentioned is that uh, anyone who found himself a stranded, if he's allied, he's sent back to the Allies. Yeah. And if he's from the Axis, then he's kept uh, in a prisoner of war camp. Yes. So this is. Yeah. This is definitely very interesting. How many were there? I mean, there were a huge number in the end? Or? No, there would not have been huge numbers. Mm -hmm. I, 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 can't, I can't tell you the exact numbers, mm -hmm. but um, because, because we were neutral, uh, the, the uh, people who found themselves in Ireland generally found themselves in Ireland by accident, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they didn't particularly want to be there. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but I couldn't tell you the exact numbers. Of course. You know, yeah. So World War II ended, and... Uh, Post-war Ireland has seen another wave of, of immigration. Yeah. Was that really inevitable? Um, in some ways, yes. But in some ways, it was just a continuation of what had happened before. Um, uh, my my parents, um, uh, my parents' generation, uh, would talk about the very very bleak time that Ireland had after the war. Uh, Ireland was not included in um, the the Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. We did get some money. Uh, but but it was not included in general in the Marshall Plan. So while the rest of Europe was growing, uh, and particularly Britain, uh, Ireland was not. There were jobs in Britain, so people left for those jobs, mm -hmm. and 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 um, there there weren't jobs in Ireland. Um, so yes, I think I think in 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 some ways it was inevitable because of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. in some ways it was inevitable because of history. Um, and our economic policy at the time was protectionist uh, and insular, mm. uh, and that probably didn't help to keep people in Ireland. So what the, was the direction this time? Was it also to the West, to the States and Canada? Or it was no, in, 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 in the 1950s and 1960s it was much, much more towards Britain. Really? You know, yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, again, like I say, because, because of the growth. Of, and they uh, stayed there, sir? Many, many of them did. And even though I was talking earlier about the, 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 the very many uh, Irish labouring class, um, we no, we're now in a situation where many of those who, who come from an Irish background, from those who emigrated in the 50s and 60s, um, are leading British companies. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we, we have very, very many prominent Irish businessmen in Britain, uh, or Anglo, um, Irish. British Irish. I'm not sure exactly yeah. how you describe them. Uh, British of Irish of, of Irish descent, uh, who um, whose, whose parents went to went to the UK in the 50s and 60s. And they they maintain they they maintain their Irish uh, citizenship, or they they took the, up the British or whatever. Well, you know, we because of the complex nature of the relationship between Britain and Ireland. Um, uh, the Irish people have always had a particular uh, status in the UK where they could be Irish and British mm -hmm. uh, and there was never too many questions asked. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the interesting effects of the British decision to leave the European Union is many of those who are entitled to Irish citizenship because of their grandparents having been born in Ireland um, are now asserting that right 
to Irish citizenship. So we've had uh, a vast number of, of people applying mm-hmm. for Irish passports really? since since uh, 18 months ago. So they are added to the census nowadays, so you can find almost a well, trace of some of, of more well, when they well, are in the thousands or something? Oh, they're in the, in the, even in the hundreds of thousands. Really? Yes, ah. yeah. Uh, a remarkable thing that uh, many people don't know is that uh, up to a quarter of the population of Britain mm-hmm. is of Irish descent. Mm-hmm. You're born so, on the island of so Ireland. So you're invading Britain, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, some people might see it that way, yes. Some people might see it that way. You're, yeah. success, you're, you're victorious <laughs> in the end, right? <laughs> so I yeah. think after the break we have to talk about the miracle. And the miracle at rest. So, if we, we, if we can div- divide it, I mean, of course, uh, miracle can. start of a miracle, and then suddenly some arrest of this uh, sure. death. Sure. So after sure. the break. So back again, word of info, and you can call us at two five seven eight nine four zero seven with His Excellency Ambassador uh, Mr. Uh, Sean O'Regan, Ambassador of Ireland in Egypt. So back again, word of info. So talking with His Excellency Ambassador uh, Sean O'Regan about the eighties, suddenly. Things. I mean, it's not sudden, of course. I mean, the, the country has been prepared for that. The, the, there is a, an economic boom. Mm. There is a surge of jobs. Uh, Ireland became a peaceful haven, and people were starting to find jobs, finding new businesses, and th- suddenly Ireland is becoming like uh, the Irish tiger. As if you use the expression, I mean, they, it was used actually. There, sure. like there are Asian tigers. There is the Irish tiger, where it was a very good place for investment and starting businesses and lucrative choices. Mm. Tell us about this big economic boom, sir. Yeah. Well, as you said, um, the boom did not come suddenly, um, even though some people might might think of it that way. Um, it really all started as early as the late 1950s, when Ireland decided to change its economic policy. And there were, there were three or four major policy decisions that were taken. One was to establish an organization called the Industrial Development Authority, whose task was to go out and attract foreign direct investment. The other was uh, to to change our policy, as I said, to go from a, a protectionist small island economy to a world trading economy. Mm-hmm. And, and that was very, very important for us. And then the third, and I think perhaps underestimated uh, thing was up until 1968 uh, you could only go to secondary school in Ireland if you had money mm. because sec- secondary school was not free and the decision was taken in 1968 to make secondary school free. Mm. That led in turn to a boom in the number of people who were able to go to university because they had the qualifications um, and uh, measures were put in place to ensure that people could, could go to university. So by the time you get to the 1980s and I graduated uh, from university in 1984. Um, you still don't have that boom, but you begin to have what we like to call the green shoots mm. of, 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 of econ- economic growth. Um, and uh, then in the 90s, we began to see those green shoots taking very strong roots and beginning to flourish. Um, very, very important, all of this, was our membership of the European Union. We joined the European Union in 1973. Almost the same time that Britain... We, Britain we, joined, joined. we joined on the same day as Britain and the same day as Denmark, mm. uh, uh, on the 1st of January 1973. Um, that had two, two effects. One is it opened a new, lots of new markets for Irish goods, uh, and particularly for Irish agricultural goods. The second is that it reduced our economic dependence on Britain enormously. We went from exporting about 70% of our, pro- uh, of our production to UK uh, in, in 1973 to now exporting only about 13%. So you have broken the, the monopoly, right? We've, we've, br- we've broken that dependence on Britain. Mm. Uh, we, we broke it back in the, back in the 1990s. Um, the other thing that helped, of course, was uh, the, the whole uh, process of globalization, which mm. opened up new markets, ever, ever more new markets for Irish goods. Uh, the political changes in Northern Ireland, um, the peace process which had begun in the, in the uh, well, to be honest, had begun almost from the time the conflict began in Northern Ireland, but which, which came, to, came to close to resolution uh, in the 1990s, and particularly in 1998 with the Good Friday Agreement, meant that those who might have been hesitant about investing in Ireland because of political concerns 
no longer had that hesitation. Mm -hmm. And so we had a boom in foreign direct investment. Um, and um, it has to be said as well that we had uh, a lot of easy credit, mm -hmm. which also fueled economic growth. Um, and so, yes, we, 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 as, you, as you mentioned, we were described as the Celtic Tiger. Uh, it was a roaring success. Um, we, um, at one point in the, 19, in, the, in the 2000s, we had some 134 nationalities mm -hmm. working in Ireland because we didn't have enough people to do all the jobs that were available. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and, that, and that was a big challenge for, for Ireland. Um, and then, as you mentioned, uh, it all came crashing down yes, in 2008. 2000, 2008, I, I remember on that day, me and my wife were in New York, and suddenly came the waiter, told us, did you hear what happened? I said, what? He said, the markets have crashed, the the stock exchange is crashing, everything is, and the world, and he, I mean, like all the waiters in the United States, somebody, every one of them is having either a side job or he's a student or whatever. Mm. So the man was very highly educated, and he said to me, I think the world will never be the same again. Yeah. And yes, all the world has entered into recession in the year 2008, and we found uh, Ireland, unfortunately, as Egypt at that time as well, was suffering. So tell us what happened. I mean, I mean in, the, in, the, in the United States, it was the bubble of the, the credit of housing and things like that. Yeah. But why did uh, Ireland has uh, economy had to, uh, to, to crash as well? It, it was... I mean, it was a global financial crisis, uh, and Ireland was particularly exposed to international banks. Um, we also had a huge construction bubble, mm -hmm. um, and uh, this the, these were the main things which caused the crash. Um, uh, we also had uh, difficulties in government finances, uh, mm -hmm. and the, the, the problem there um, was quite simply that uh, we were paying out um, in government services and, and, and salaries far more than was being taken in in taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and with the crash, uh, particularly property taxes, collapsed completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we found ourselves at the real centre of a storm um, in, in European finance. Um, and um, the, Irish, the Irish housing crisis was about to become a European um, financial crisis. Mm. So we had to have an intervention. Uh, we had the IMF uh, come in. We had support coming in from from the European Union. Um, and uh, we had support coming in also from, um, from many countries bilaterally around the world, mm. particularly the United Kingdom, uh, giving loans on, 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 on good credit terms. Mm. And in that way, we were able to stabilize the economy. Uh, and with prudence and, I would say, clever uh, fiscal management, we, we managed to recover. And, you know, I, I remember a previous finance minister um, uh, saying that when the Irish economy does recover, it will take off like a rocket. Mm. Um, and this was one of the things which was always the case. The fundamentals of the Irish economy aside from the housing issue, the construction, uh, the construction problem, were good. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, we had very, very good companies which were producing very, high, very good products. High-tech high -tech, uh, uh, products as well. High-tech products. Um, uh, and, and, uh, but not just high-tech. I mean, we're, we're very proud of our ag agricultural industry it's as a, well. It's a di diversified you know? economy. It's, it's a very, what makes it's it very unique. Yes, yes. And, and, and the number and, of the population is, is, is not as huge as other countries. No, so no. the surplus can, no. can really be felt, right? Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. So, you know, we, 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 we're well on the way to recovery uh, and we're, we have the best growth rate in Europe at the moment. Public finances are now stable. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're doing well now. We're... we're where, where we were called the Celtic Tiger, we're now being called by some people the Celtic Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> That's the resurrection of a phoenix. Yes, it's yes. one of the three uh, unbelievable myths, right? Yes, yes. But yeah. when we're talking about phoenix, we are. Uh, the world has been celebrating last week. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't know how why they're celebrating this ten years of, uh, on the passage of the financial crisis. Yes. So this is really tough. 
Do you think that uh, we are can go into a financial uh, the world can go into a financial crisis as well? Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not. I'm uh, not a pro- of I'm, course. I'm not an economist. I'm not a prophet. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, 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 uh, I think. I think there is uh, there is um, every possibility that we can go into another global financial crisis. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I think I hope that uh, governments, at least, um, and and those who are regulating the financial services. Uh, have learned the lessons of 2008 mm-hmm. and are are being more prudent in the way they approach it, um, uh, approach the econ- approach the economy. Certainly, in the European Union, there are there are much better measures now in place to deal with the beginnings of the financial crisis. Mm-hmm. So, I I would hope that we wouldn't see anything like the collapse of Lehman. Yes, uh, which means our future. fingers crossed, as they yes. always say, right? Yes, yes, indeed. yes, indeed. So after the break, we have to talk about Egyptian-Irish relations, which I believe that you're a, a great fan, right? Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> so back again, word of info, and you can call us at 2578-9407. So back again, word of info with His Excellency, uh, Ambassador Sean O'Regan, Ambassador of Ireland to Egypt, and Dr. Amal Brook, Professor Plastic Sergei at the Shams University. So now we go back to your job, sir, because <laughs> Egyptian Irish relations. I mean, uh, I think Ireland and Egypt have been very friendly all through the years, especially with the same common background, the same history, and the same period of history. I mean, of the independence. Uh, you've, you got your independence in 1923, we got it in 1922, but definitely there are even more uh, sort of communications and connections between your revolutionary leaders and Saad Zaghlour of Egypt and sharing a lot of points of view and there was a lot of correspondence. So how far we go? I mean, we go very, very long way. Right? Well, some people would say we go back to the pharaohs. Yes. Um, the daughter of, uh, I forget which pharaoh it was, but her name was Scotta. Mm. Uh, and from this we get the the old Latin name for Ireland, Scotus. Oh, really? um, <laughs> but I think I think that's maybe a little bit fanciful. There are people who uh, have put forward very good theses about the arrival of Christianity in Ireland, uh, yes. that it came from uh, North Egyptian Africa monks, yes. and Egyptian monks uh, mm. going going there, mm. and 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 there are certainly parallels. Um, but uh, being more realistic about it, and uh, where we can talk about recorded history, um, the relationship is is long and strong. Um, the, as you said, um, the the influence of Irish revolutionary leaders, um, particularly those of 1916, um, was felt around the world at that time, uh, and and influenced independence movements in countries as diverse as India, Kenya. Uh, Egypt indeed um, and um, if you go even further back to a man we mentioned earlier uh, Daniel O'Connell he certainly had a, a huge influence on uh, ideas of peaceful protest and uh, encouraging people to to um, to look at politics in a different way um, but uh, coming back to the Egyptian Irish relationship, um, we opened the embassy here in uh, 1978. Mm-hmm. E- Egypt opened its embassy in Dublin in 1976, I believe, um, and uh, that's been very, very important in building the relationship, as as embassies always do. Um, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned yourself. Uh, uh, you, your own father went to Dublin to mm-hmm. to, to study medicine. Uh, there was back in the 1950s and 1960s quite a strong stream of Egyptian traffic to Ireland for education of, of various kinds mm. um, and Ireland has always been very very open mm. to um, to people from Egypt coming to Ireland um, uh, and they're warmly welcomed so they've made a major contribution to, to Irish society um, we're keen to build that relationship. Uh, we're keen to see. We we also have, of course, a, a reasonably strong Irish community in in Egypt. Um, both people who are of Egyptian origin, who were born in 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 Ireland mm-hmm. and have Irish citizenship and have returned to Egypt, but also very very many um, Irish people who have married Egyptians mm-hmm. and have made their homes in Egypt, mm-hmm. uh, and they're right through the country. We also have, of course, uh, a long 
education relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, many of the nuns who were in the in the schools in Cairo and Alexandria were yes. were of Irish origin, and yes. I keep meeting people who say I was taught by Irish nuns, and uh, we have one or two of them still alive. Mm -hmm. um, they're quite elderly now, but um, these human to human contacts are very very important. Mm -hmm. um, we would like, as I said, to, to build the relationship up further, particularly on the economic side. Um, mm. And we're working hard to do that. Uh, we'd like to see more Irish food available in Egypt. Uh, we'd like to see more Irish tourists coming to Egypt. Mm. Uh, and uh, we're looking at ways we can do that. Um, we're also trying now to do a lot more to expose Egypt and Egyptian people to Irish culture. Mm. And uh, we're, we're very proud of our culture. Um, it's it's one of the the great things about Ireland is that we we value culture as uh, something that's very very important for society. Because uh, I think I mean it's one of the I mean it's such a small country. I'm sorry to use the word small. Just like I, I'm talking about population, not sure. about greatness. Sure. And in the twenty, uh, she, I, Ireland has produced four winners of the Nobel Prize for Literature. I mean George Bernard Shaw, William Butler, Yeats, Samuel Beckett, and. And Haney, although not a Nobel Prize winner, James Joyce is widely considered to be one of the most significant writers of the 20th century. So how come such a uh, small population and producing a great production of uh, Nobel laureates, and as you have just mentioned, the lit lit literature and culture cooperation, I think this is very valuable because culture always cooperation brings people together. Absolutely. Um, I, think, I think there are many reasons for it. Um, and. Um, one of them, perhaps, is that loss of a Gaelic nobility in the 17th century. Mm. Um, and uh, we're very much a country where people, mm, folk culture is very, very important. Mm. This is why our music uh, is, is very, very strong and why it's very simple in many respects, but quite complex in others. Uh, we don't have big instruments mm. to play Irish music. They're instruments you can carry with you. And of course, the storytelling tradition yes. is extremely important, and this is where the where where, where our literature comes in. All of our, our great poets, all of our great writers, are people who can tell good stories. Yes, definitely. Um, George Bernard Shaw was a master. George Bernard Shaw, a master. Um, <laughs> Yeats and everyone. Oh, and I think the fact the influence of Irish language hmm. on the way we speak English uh, has also made us have a unique voice. Um, and uh, as one of our great writers, a man by the name of John McGarren, said, uh, we speak English that's woven on a Gaelic loom. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, <laughs> and and I think that's I, I think I think that's very true. We have turns of phrase that exist as direct translations from Irish grammar into English, which people find charming. So definitely, it is definitely charming. With a number of uh, of uh, Nobel laureates who have just given a mention. The novelists, the people, the Irish people, the effect of Irish people in diaspora. Sir, it was a great pleasure having you with us. And you have to promise us to come again. I would love to come again. It was my it was my pleasure. Really to, we can talk forever about Ireland and about Irish Egyptian relations, but it was really a beautiful good afternoon to have you with us, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Yes. Thank you. And by this, we come to the end of Word of Info with His Excellency, Ambassador Sean Reagan, Ambassador of Ireland in Egypt, Dr. Amr Obrook, Professor of Plastic Surgery at the Enchant University. And we would like to see you next Thursday, same time, same station, FM 95.4.